Special Forces is small. And it requires what we call a special breed of man. And every loss is a tremendous loss for us. Just remember, Nate will never forget you. He's out! That's some of the guys down here at the camp organized a, a baseball team. Oh. 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 Safe! This kid, at 13 years old, he was walking him across his usual range and stepped on a mine. His life changed forever. I tell you guys, you're in good company. You're in a unique fraternal order of warriors. I believe we've left this country in much better shape than when we arrived. Forces is small and uh, it's very highly skilled and it requires what we call a special breed of man and every loss is a tremendous loss for us. We get to know everybody, we live closely together, uh, we spend a lot of time together and we bond uh, more strongly than most military units ever bond. That's just the nature of, of special operations units and uh, losses like uh, the loss of Sergeant Chapman can be quite devastating. Sergeant First Class Chapman, uh, January 4th of uh, 2002, was killed in an ambush not far from here in Host. This airfield was named after him, this airfield and what we call Safe House. We, uh, we take great pride in that. And that affects us very deeply. My name is Craig. I'm a Sergeant First Class, United States Special Forces, and I knew Nate Chapman for about 10 years. The day Nate was killed, I came to work that morning, and I knew something was going on because the uh, commander had this look on his face. At one point, I pulled myself into the commander's office and closed the door, and I looked at the major and I said, Sir, I said, I know something's wrong, what is it? And he looked at me, and he didn't have to say a word. I had already knew. Later that day, we found out that Nate had been killed. My name's Scott. I'm a Sergeant First Class in the United States Army. I'm assigned to First Special Forces Group. I knew Nate Chapman. Uh, we were assigned to 2nd Ranger Battalion, 75th Infantry Regiment, back in the late 80s. Nate Chapman, he wasn't the uh, first American killed in the war on terror, but he was the first American killed in a combat action with the enemy. I think if he knew he was gonna get killed over there, he would've gone anyway. That's just the type of people we are. Um, everything has a purpose. Nate Chapman is a special forces soldier. He's a big physical guy, very smart. I'm gonna miss Nate Chapman. I think a lot of people are gonna miss Nate Chapman. On September 11th, Nate and I were in Thailand together on a mission. And we all will never forget that day. And after seeing the events and what transpired that day, the first person that spoke up was Nate. Nate was furious. Nate was always the guy that wanted to be the first to go and do something. Just remember, Nate will never forget you. A lot 
last night, uh, part of the Afghan military forces who work with one of the uh, special forces A teams captured a person that the uh, U.S. forces have been looking for for questioning and regarding the shooting of Sergeant Chapman. Vehicle on the road. received information that he was here in uh, Host City, captured him, and brought him uh, to the custody of the Special Forces A-Team. And uh, he has been brought here to this facility and will be transported from here to Bagram for further questioning and for identification. My name is Do. I'm a first lieutenant. The average individual by himself is just not that fearsome. In fact, you feel sorry for, for some of these people. And it's, it's odd that we captured someone recently that could have been responsible for Chapman's death. You, know, you see him, he's a small guy. And uh, it's just simply not impressive. You know, that's, you know, that's the problem with wars. Little men can become very big with the use of a gun. You know whether this guy was AQ or just a local tribal member that had some vendetta against the United States, that's all fine. I'm glad we have him, and I hope he goes to uh, trial, and I hope we find out that this guy really is one of Nate's shooters, and I hope he gets uh, what he deserves. of Sergeant Chapman affects us very deeply. And in fact, uh, one of the flags that has been flying here recently that flew on the 4th of July is going to be uh, packaged up and, and carried and delivered to his wife as, uh, as a memento from here. Tell Nate now, if I could, that he has no worries. We will all always look out for his family, his wife, his children, and know that they're taken care of. I have not lost anybody um, in my immediate circle, so uh, I've been fortunate in that, that regard. However, the idea that you might give your life for your country, that's not just something to say. It's a fact, and it's a fact proven by Chapman, and why? Why would he die for me? And it's because of, it's an idea. It's, it's an idea worth dying for, you know, that your people are meant to be free. I'm Jay. I'm an 18 Charlie, which is a Special Forces engineer. We're on our way down here to the Orgoon Primary School, where we're going to have our first Little League baseball game ever here in Orgoon. I guess uh, some of the guys down here at the camp organized a, a baseball team, um, actually a couple teams. And uh, today's practice, tomorrow's going to be the first game. So I guess we're coming down here to kind of show them the rules. I don't think these guys have ever seen like American baseball. so. That's what we're down here to do today. It should be pretty fun. Hey, you guys know it's a little bit about pitching. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. Really? Sure. I've got a pitcher and a catcher that are down there in the bullpen. 
And where's the bullpen? Yes. It's right this down there. Okay. Like the white line in the ball. Get gotcha. by the catcher. Catcher? Pitcher. Salam. The guys here at this camp have, have done great things. Try from there. Well, they're gracious enough to let you know other people help. I uh, see a little further. Well, they let us volunteer and, and come down and help them with practices and you know the big thing, the first little league game in Afghanistan. Okay, when I go to swing, I step forward. Yeah. The kids love baseball here. Uh, my wife sent a couple of balls and gloves for. Uh, the children that are here at the camp, and they picked it up like no tomorrow. I mean, they just, they were naturals at it. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get on the phone, I'm gonna call back home, I'm gonna talk to a few people, and uh, see what they can send. And before I knew it, I had boxes of baseballs and boxes of baseball gloves and everything we needed to start a, a Little League baseball team. Short stop. We're sitting here in Orgoon, which was the home of the Taliban. First it's base. very important for us to be out there and to be involved in the community and to find out what their needs are and let them know that, you know, this isn't about America coming over here to kill a bunch of people. It's also about America coming over here to free oppressed people and to help them out. Catcher and outfield. Yeah, I tell you, back in America, I've seen a lot of Little League parks. This is probably the only Little League park you'll see with a tank in the outfield. Nobody. It's your time to drop the bat next time. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah! Tell them they can't throw the ball at them. <laughs> Two weeks, it'll look like a professional team out here. <laughs> Headmaster! Yep. Headmaster, explain to him that we, at the beginning of every game, we, get, we give the honor of somebody important to let them throw the first ball to the catcher. And since he's let us use the field and has helped us so much with the kids and everything, we'd like to honor him and let him throw the first ball to the catcher. All right, let's play ball. Play ball! <laughs> Safe! <laughs> Everybody, get a piece of gum. Seeing them play baseball is just, uh, it's got to be a huge, huge slap in the face for the Al-Qaeda. I know uh, coming over here that uh, these guys couldn't even fly kites before we came, much less uh, play baseball. Out! You're out of there! That was a great snag right there. I'm telling you what, there's not too many kids back home that can do it like that. It's hard to believe that this is only second day he's had a ball in his hand. Who's the winners? Who's the winners? Uh, the winners, I think, Afghan club. Afghan club? Afghan, Afghan team won, and this Shaheen lose. Are they gonna... I was also part of Shaheen. <laughs> <laughs> line up in a line here, in a line. They were the winners. Congratulations. But what I want them to do is I want them to walk down here and I want them to walk by this team and I want them to shake everybody's hand. Actually, you know what? They, they were all winners. I'd rather see them picking up a baseball glove and a bat than an AK-47 because when we first came to town, that's what you saw, 12-year-old kids carrying guns. Before the war, the criminals and something like Al-Qaeda, Chicheans, because they didn't propagate to play. Now we can play. Yeah. yeah. We placed. Um, uh, we love with Americans. We love with this place. That's, that's good, yeah. Being out here at this place we're at now, getting to actually work with some of the local people, um, it's really changed my viewpoint on, on the, the good people in Afghanistan. You know, I didn't realize there were good people. One of the boxes I received was from my sister. And she had sent four baseballs and four baseball gloves. And inside it was a letter. No, we got some more. She said, here's some gloves and balls for the children, but do me one favor. Make sure that one of these balls and one of these ball gloves 
gets into the hands of a girl. And I thought to myself, oh no. I was like, I'm having a hard enough time getting them to let them go to school, let alone let them play sports and things. Maybe in the future you'll see a, a little change in the culture. Women have been oppressed here for a long time. Did you see a home run? It's just a, a wonderful feeling, being able to see these kids. Being here, we're showing these people uh, you know, a lot of things that are going to make their lives better for the future. Um, you know, and being an American, just being able to, to help the people of this country live better. You know, it feels great. Millions of mines in Afghanistan, uh, so it's impossible to uh, to get away from them completely. Uh, I think it's I think it's the most heavily mined country on earth. A guy with a gun doesn't scare me, but a mine is just a silent bomb waiting for you to step on it, and it can be anywhere. This whole area has been heavily fought over on four or five different occasions over the course of the last 20 years. As a result, you've got approximately 100,000 mines that are all over the place. You're very aware that you would never walk off the well-beaten paths. Dogs even know it. I call a stray dog across a field to come to you with a piece of meat. He'll come to you on the well-beaten path because he's seen some of his fellow dogs blown up. A disproportionately high number of mine victims are children. Kids have to grow up fast around here, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate. This kid, at 13 years old, is in charge of his own uh, goat herd and was walking him across his usual range and stepped on a mine, and his life changed forever. And see, his hands are burned. Both of his hands are burned. Poor fella. He lost a leg. You can see it's a bad injury. He's got blast. He's got garbage blown all the way up in this leg. So all in all, it's a pretty horrible injury. A lot of these kids uh, die from these types of injuries in this country. So having survived, yeah, he's fairly lucky. We're going up to an old uh, Russian outpost that uh, this is the same area where the, the young man got his, his uh, leg blown off the other day. And uh, we've got, looks like some deminers out here now. We talked to them the other day and uh, asked them if they could come out and start cleaning this area. This is our, our landmine probe. So this is actually how we look for landmines. And so I'm just going through probing the soil here where I pinpointed the piece of metal with the metal detector. Aardvark is a flailing type of engineering piece of equipment that tries to allow the ground to be pounded by chains that get whirled around a central um, axis that whips the ground and detonates the mines, hopefully, without hurting the crewmen of the, um, the Aardvark. The biggest threat around here is uh, unexploded ordnance. You know, a lot of the sappers have actually gotten hurt trying to disarm them or blow them up. Mr. Braddock worked as a, a specialist in clearing mines using dogs. Uh, he was uh, well experienced and had done his, uh, applied his trade in numerous places before. Uh, he was uh, working with the U.S. forces down there, clearing mines out, and basically stepped on one. 
and uh, tore off his uh, right lower leg and broke his left leg, and that's why he's being transported here. Landmines serve not to kill, but to, to maim and to terrorize and to injure them so badly that tremendous amounts of resources are going to be required to put that soldier back together and in doing so devastate the other medical capabilities. And that person is crippled for life. The landmine wasn't lethal, but it definitely is going to have a lifelong effect on his uh, health, his capabilities, his lifestyle, and his perception of himself. Landmines are very difficult to eradicate because they're very difficult to find all of them. A shift of the sand, shift of the winds can hide for years uh, deadly explosives. They destroy towns for years to come. Lord knows how long we we'll find landmines in Afghanistan. Truly frightening. Bravo 2, this is Delta 1, over. Delta 1, Bravo 2. I'm Staff Sergeant Drew, 18 Delta Special Forces Medic, ODA 361. When I first joined the Army uh, almost 10 years ago, I wanted to join Special Forces. Ready to go, so ready. let's go. I went to selection, passed it. I always wanted to be a medic, my wife and I, we talked a lot about it, and she wanted to support me in this. So I got it. I was able to go through the medical course. This pressure 60. right here. 18 Deltas are the elite medics in the Army. They're the Special Forces guys. They're in places like this. They're in very austere places where sometimes there's no other medical support available for long periods of time and long distances. And Drew, he's extremely good at his job. And one of the reasons that people are extremely good at their job is because they constantly try to improve themselves. Okay, grab the head. Grab the head. All right, stabilize the leg. Better roll. I love being able to get a guy that's been severely hurt and then taking care of him, and at the end, he comes back and he puts his hand out to you and shakes your hand. Dr. Drew, our Australian. I watched him work guys with crushed pelvises and car accidents. I've seen him work on guys that have had terrible trauma from stepping on a mine, missing most of their foot, uh, open lacerations to both hamstrings, abdomen, elbow, and uh, I have the utmost confidence in Drew. Material stuff. Now, they're professional surgeons. Yes. Can I have a knife? And load me the thing is, they trust us enough to prepare the patient before they go into the operating room. And not only that, They'll actually let us in the operating room and assist them. The, the tibia comes to a peak right, right. and I'm trying not to skive out of the corner. Okay. So they want to get, it's almost triangle shape. Okay. So we're we're happy to have all the help we can get, particularly somebody who's, who's that skilled and, and that well-trained. All right, let's get out of here. Do they, do they wait to see us, basically? Or? Yeah, they're waiting. Okay, great. How'd they know I was coming? <laughs> what? What's that? I guess we're going to see some patients. There's a, no shortage. 220. 220 people is ready. 220 people is ready. Hey, you're not a woman. This is the man. The man over that way. Women, go that way. So there's a line of women? All right, let me... I can start with them. That's a custom in our country to take care of the women first. Respecting the women, they need to go back. He's got major bacteria all over him. Look, see, this is all animal blood all over his face here. You know, all I can do is pretty much clean it around and dress it. Okay, he's gonna get a PPD test. See if he's been, and all this can really tell him is it's been exposed to TB. What he really needs is a sputum culture. Yeah. You know this? Can they do this? No, they can't do this? They will do, yes. Okay. That looks bad. <laughs> when was this compared to this? Do we know when this was? 
I want him to turn his head away like this. I want him to breathe like this. Nice deep breaths when I say yes. You're healthy. Go home. Go play. Find a wife. Yeah, find a wife. Okay. Right, we saw as many people as we can today. We have other work to go. I'm sorry that there are so many sick people still. A lot of guys have just, you know, um, arthritis. They're old. A lot of people are old. They have eye problems. There's just no advanced medical care for any of these people. I think a lot of these just talk to these people and tell them that they have good doctors here. Give them some confidence. That's what we're trying to do here. You clean them. It's important. And you guys too. Clean the teeth. Otherwise you'll be like this. Yeah. You gotta wash them. I think if we continue to help these people, give them food, give them some medical care, and demine the place. What happened to a mine, a bullet? Protect them as best we can. I really think that they'll look after us. That's one of the keys about um, SF Special Forces is cultural orientation. Even though it's a, uh, a DCU camouflaged uh, uniform, we wear a lot of different hats. Go home, Habib Shah. Give me fire, buddy. All right. Cultural orientation in this area, I think, is the key to success. This is the school that's uh, being built by civil affairs. Pretty much all the labor is being supplied by the AMF soldiers. <sighs> soldiers, come up here. We, let's talk to the soldiers and explain to them this is their country, this is their school. Give them some motivation to work. Okay, we'll give you chai and bread tomorrow. Okay, but the commanders, all right, are responsible for the soldiers. All right? And I think that having the army here, the AMF, and uh, stopping the bad guys from coming to this area is, is one of the big benefits. Okay. You know, all they really want is just a peaceful life. I think that they need to know that when we're gone, and they can take care of themselves. I understand this is a boring job. Uh, it's okay with the place that I can say. Okay. But it's very important that this school is built so the children can go and learn. And, um, it's your future. Now, you got to understand, too, that this is only the second girls' school in the whole area that's been built in years. These kids here are the future of this country. So uh, this is a very, very important project for us. So let's hopefully uh, the little girls can uh, be educated women. Hey, give me some side of us. We've touched on a lot of things about the community and what we're doing, you know, the helping of the people. But the terrorists that destroyed the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and killed a lot of American lives, um, we're over here for not just payback, but to stop that from ever happening again. And you know, I think what was, for me, was just such a great feeling was the way the country came together. You know, it just came together so strong. And I, I felt so patriotic and uh, the flags wa waving. And I really hope the people back home haven't forgotten that. I hope they haven't forgotten all the people that died, um, you know, for um, yeah, you know, that's when my children are uh, growing up and out of the house, and I see them with their families, and they're living in a safe environment. I really think I have played my part here. Profiles from the front line will continue in a moment here on ABC. guys kind of uh, get attached to uh, 
to the place. I know they, they think Orgoon is like their home. They're a little, little upset that they have to leave. They've made a lot of friends here. Uh, people downtown uh, really like us. The, the, the soldiers, uh, they don't want us to leave. Everybody uh, comes up and tells us how upset they are that we're leaving. Here goes the names. All right, fellas, here it is. The big list. Hey, call him, call him from the top and have him move to the side. Okay. Okay, Rod Matula. Ratman. Rod Matula, Sadamin, Bacha Zada, Pier, Nasser Han, Cheryl Lee, Articula. That's what we got, fellas. There's 15 guys. That's, That's all 15. We can take. That's all we can take. The day we told them goodbye, you know, we can only take 15 to the new place. That was pretty rough. They're not a better bunch of guys out here. It's gonna be hard to tell them goodbye. I hope that uh, whoever's in charge makes a decision to take care of them. Otherwise, you know, they're gonna be left to the freaking thugs and, you know, working for us, they've made some enemies, so. It's kind of hard. Especially Wazir, kid 17 years old. His father died when he was real small, and uh, he's been taking care of his mother since I think he was about 14. This cup and these uh, flowers, that's for the Mr. Mark, that he spent a good time with us, uh, and we are very, uh, very, very happy that he worked very hard for our people up the Urgun. All right. Uh, all right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, sir. Wazir, you take care of yourself, too, yes, all right? Sir. We are very happy about your service. Sir. Well, thank you. We had a great time in, in, in the town's a great place, so yes, keep working on it, all see right? When I come sir. back in a couple of years, I want to see even more shops, more people, and everything real nice, quiet, and Hopefully peaceful, all right? Yeah, OK. Take your post, our Major. Bad A's. Hey, listen, guys. Uh, let me just tell you that uh, I can't tell you how proud uh, both Command Sergeant Major and I are of every single person in this formation. I, I will tell you that uh, you've earned the right to wear the Combat Infantryman's Badge and the Combat Medical Badge. And I'll tell you guys, you're in good company. You're in a unique fraternal order of warriors. And those warriors are from the First and Second World War, Korea, Vietnam, Grenada, Panama, El Salvador, Kuwait, Iraq, Somalia, and now Afghanistan. I'm honored to be your battalion commander, and I'm truly humbled to stand amongst your ranks. Again, fellas, I would tell you congratulations. Detachments, attention. <laughs> It's hard to be away from your, your family, but at the same time, someone's got to do it. If you can come here and do something right, do the right thing for the right reason, it's worth it. It's a good look at my stash you got there. Checkpoint three entering target area. I had the feeling this war might go on for a long time, maybe not just here in Afghanistan, but uh, in other parts of the world. So I'll probably go wherever these wars take us. You got your brother a letter tell what you're doing over here. Does that say? I want to make sure that terrorism is squashed. Rumors that you know no one cares about the war over here anymore. They say it's over. But hey, we're still here, right? It's going to be um, right. a long, tired road to go yet, though. This is an honor, let me tell you. Yes, sir. Mark, you're a great soldier. This has truly been an honor. And, uh, great day to see you make Sergeant Major here shortly. 
<laughs> we're we're uh, building goodwill here, and we're definitely knocking down the bad guys. So I guess my one message to, if I could get that out to everybody, is don't expect results overnight. It's going to take years, but we're willing to do it. My team's willing to do it. I'm willing to do it. So let us do it. What I'm looking forward to right now is a large pepperoni pizza and a pitcher of cold beer. Team, take a picture because it won't last long. My name is Danette Jones, and I'm getting ready to go home. <laughs> I must take my sign home. I created it, and I'm taking it. You leaving? Hell yeah. When? Come on, dude. Saturday. Can you take me with you? Hell no. You got to do your thing. <laughs> Saturday, I should be getting on a big C-117 aircraft on my way home in New York City. I get to see my, my sons, my three sons. I want to sit outside and see, play football and just have fun, love them and hug them and kiss them and go shopping. That's about all with my babies. Thanks a lot. I'll see you before You're you go, right? You're a good guy. Thank you. I'm very happy to be going home. Very happy. Because I miss my family. I'm looking forward to heading on home. And I feel like I'm finished here. Thank you. Good morning. Salam. To Tutorisi. To Tasha Kua. I'm probably I, leaving today. We are very really happy to. Uh, long time we worked in Afghanistan. We are grateful from all of our American which we work for Thank our you. country. Thank you I very much. I hope you reach uh, good Thank you. Uh, and well to your family. Thank you very much. I'm going to miss a lot of the people that I've met. I'm gonna miss my job, the soldiers. Oh, I love the hell out of them. I love them. LT, Mr. Goody Rich. All right, I'm getting the hug. I'm not in uniform, so it's I don't right. give a shit. Oh, I made you some good, good friends. You good. Have a good safe trip, oh. Sorry, Jones, oh. you take care. Oh. I'm so glad I'm going. We'll see you when we get back. <laughs> my dad used to work at the World Trade Center. I have friends that worked at the World Trade Center. Now, when I go back home to New York, there won't be any World Trade Center. I feel I'm serv serving my purpose here. Whether I'm cooking, uh, garden, front gate, whatever it is we came here to do, we're accomplishing. We're capturing as many of the bad guys as we can. I came here as one of the first guys to come to Bagram, and I helped establish an aid station. Saw about 3,000 people and got an awful lot done. All right. Well, I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we've left this country in much better shape than when we arrived. I've done my job, and I've done it well, and I've done it to the best of my ability, and I've survived. And I'm going home. Strap on the feed sack, take it, get a rain locker, hit the rack. Time out here has been fun filled and action pack, but uh, I'm ready to go home. Ready to go home to see my family. Ready? John's homecoming. For us, 
it's uh, not sleeping the night before, just kind of staying up because you're nervous, you're excited, you can't sleep. It's coming down to the pier at 5.30 in the morning, knowing they're not coming till 8, but just the excitement of knowing they're coming and watching the ship and watching them come in, just watching it come around the bend. It, it's just a feeling you'll never experience. The thing that I will never forget up on that flight deck is the people. And they work their asses off up there every single day. God darn American, I'm here to tell you that. I'm just glad to be back home. Yes, I'll miss some things on the boat, but uh, it's nothing like the good old USA, being back here on the beach. Yes, now that I got off the ship and everything, met my family and stuff, I guess we're gonna drive on to the house and uh, get some good food and, well, you know, and take care of some business. <laughs>